It's August the 2nd, and this is your Synthesis Sunday COVID podcast. With me, Howard Feldman, and COVID expert, Dr. Anton Myberg. The sun is shining, the windows are open, and there's a distinct feeling that spring is around the corner. There's a further sense that the numbers are stabilizing and that we might even be past our peak. Yet still, South Africa has reached more than half a million people, and there are dangers that we might become complacent. Good morning. Whilst we're enjoying the early spring, Dr. Myberg, you're on call and at the hospital. What season are you experiencing? Good morning, everybody. So we're experiencing quite a frenetic season, ups and downs, lows and highs. Um, we kind of like a English season, raining, pouring, shining, thunder, lightning, the whole barrage of seasons all in one day. So there are currently 18 million cases worldwide with 688,913 deaths and 11.3 million cases resolved. The United States has 4.7 million cases with 157,000 deaths and South Africa has 503,290 cases with 8,153 deaths and 342,461 cases resolved. The number of tests done in the country is up to 3 million and there are currently 5,227 patients admitted in hospital in Gauteng with 550 in ICU and 312 ventilated. Of note, our first 100,000 cases came over 110 days. Our second 100,000 cases came over 14 days. The third 100,000 came over nine days, the fourth over eight days, and the last 100,000 have come over nine days. So at this point in time, we are kind of stabilizing with the numbers and we are hopefully reaching this plateau that everyone has been speaking about. The, is there anything magical about re reaching a half a million people? I mean, is, does, does this mean anything? I mean, we know that, that we sit quite high up on the, the world, in terms of the world rankings, as far as COVID positive people are concerned. We sit a lot lower as far as the number of deaths are concerned. But does this mean anything? Do we yes. expect? Uh, what, this is, what this happens? is magical. This is magical. And I'll tell you why. Because of the density of the population in Gauteng, we expect the numbers to be much higher. We expect the numbers to be close to a million by this stage. And they're sitting at 500,000. So be it that it's, it's not a small number, it could have been a lot worse by this stage. The number of mortality could have been much higher at this stage. So there's a lot of positivity in all of these numbers at this point. And we're very happy with what we're seeing, even though that um, we're not happy with the virus itself. Right. Uh, the death rate, can we just talk about that in, in South Africa and in Gauteng particularly? So the death rate, a lot of people have been speaking about that there's a much higher death rate. And this people are speaking about death rates from other causes that are not COVID related. There could be cancers, there could be myocardial infarctions, could be diabetic, there could be old age. These aren't being reported in the 8,000 so-called numbers or the over 3,000 numbers in, in Gauteng per se. Um, at this point in time, the numbers are small. And that's very reassuring that hopefully the lockdown has helped with this that we're able to manage the cases better, we're able to manage them better in ICU, and the overall outcome of the cases that we are treating is much better. I, I don't know if you saw that there was this statement around, I think, 11,000 unexplained deaths or increases in, in deaths by natural causes. Uh, what's your thoughts around that? So I think that could be related to the fact that ancillary services aren't running anymore. Everything is just a COVID hospital or everything is a COVID-related disease. And people with chronic diseases or people with chronic problems aren't being attended to in multiple areas of the country, in multiple hospitals. And I think it's related to this point, not actually to the point that there's a further 11,000 COVIDs that aren't mm, related. Mm. So we don't really, we don't really know exactly. We, we, will, we will probably never know exactly we'll, what those... We'll find out one day, but I don't think for a long time. Right, right. Um, okay, the, the lots and lots of questions, and thank you everybody for, for sending them in. Uh, this week, one of the, the most notable um, news reports or, or news events that, that was circulating, it was posted on YouTube, and then it was removed, and then it was on Facebook, and then it was removed, were all of these doctors in America coming together to talk about the success of uh, um, hydroxychloroquine. So the, um, obviously, it's in the United States, it's become a highly politicized issue. Here, fortunately, 
I still believe that uh, we are focused on medicine for the sake of medicine and not politics. Obviously, politics does come into it in some, to some extent. But, uh, but this is very, very confusing because either this is a drug that is useful or it isn't. Why has it become politicized, if you can answer that? And uh, what are your thoughts on the drug per se? So there's an election coming up in America. That's why it's politicized. We all know that, that all the politicians want to have the answers. They want to have the vaccine. They want to have the treatments before the election happens. And that's the reason for it being politicized. But the, the, main, the main issue here is, as per a phase three trial that was reported in the New England Journal of Medicine, in patients hospitalized with COVID-19, hydroxychloroquine has not been associated with a reduction in 28-day mortality, but was associated with increased length of stay in hospital and an increased risk of progressing to mechanical ventilation. So it's not a game changer. It's not the ultimate medication. Do not take this medication. There are not enough reports out there to guarantee that there are benefits from being on this medication unless you are on this medication chronically for your rheumatoid arthritis or other chronic, med chronic conditions. So as a matter of course, and uh, your protocols here in South Africa, you are not using it and not for any political reason, but simply because you don't find it to be the most effective treatment. Not only are we not using it, we're not using it in combination with the zinc and azithromycin that other places are doing, even though it hasn't been shown to, to give any guarantees or any benefits to the patients. We are not using it at all. It is not part of our armamentarium of medication we're using to treat COVID. What is part of your, what, what is your go-to treatment? And I know that this differs, obviously, home treatment. You've spoken a lot about if people have COVID and are, are, are experiencing mild symptoms at home versus hospital. Just go through those again. Let's just run through the home treatment quickly. So the home treatment is your vitamins, your cocktail of vitamins, whether it's your vitamin C, your vitamin D, your thiamine, your niacin or nicotinamide, and, and your, your zinc. And those are the most important for the home medications. Once you're in hospital, those medications are either started or continued, and other medications are added. And if you are requiring oxygen, or if you need to go on higher flows of oxygen, then dexamethasone is added, or other types of corticosteroids are added. If you have got a hyperinflammatory phase or a cytokine storm, then we use medication like trastuzumab. And there are lots of studies out about this at the moment. They haven't shown them in conjunction, in conjunction with corticosteroids, but we also hopefully getting section one approval for remdesivir soon. And remdesivir, once again, is also not a game changer. It does not decrease mortality as of yet, but it does decrease your stay in hospital. So it does complement the medication that we're using together. So it's a combination of anti-inflammatory medication in the form of corticosteroids. It's a combination of inflammatory medication against interleukin-6, which is tocilizumab, and antiviral medication, as well as a whole host of other medications such as as statins, as well as melatonin, as well as culture seen as a whole other host of other medications. Mm -hmm. the, the, I spoke to somebody today who, who, who was telling me that uh, he was in hospital for COVID and uh, on his scan it showed that he had quite a significant pneumonia, I would assume caused by, by COVID. Is this a standard type of progress for somebody who is suffering from um, severe or, or more severe symptoms? So if you have got severe symptoms and you have got an pneumonia, then you will have changes on your CAT scan. Someone who's got mild, mild COVID will be un, who's not very short of breath and who's not coughing much, who's got mild asymptomatic, generally won't have any changes on the chest x-ray and then will, therefore won't necessitate having a CAT scan. But people who are ill and people who require oxygen and people who are having a hyperinflammatory phase do have changes on the CAT scan. The people who are critically ill, who land up in ICU, can have long-term changes on the CAT scans, and they can have a picture of what we call ARDS, which is acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is a ground glass opacification, which looks like ground glass on your CAT scan and shows an ARDS type of picture. And, and does that stay with you permanently? So it doesn't stay with you permanently, but it's too soon now to realize what the long-term sequelae and other consequences of, mm, mm. of this type of pneumonia are. In other words, in six months' time, will you still have residual change in your lungs? We don't know that yet. And we'll have to keep on monitoring these patients and see how they are improving. Would the, the pneumonia vaccine have helped that type of person? 
So was remember, this is not path? a typical. This is not a typical mm. pneumonia. This is a viral pneumonitis or inflammation in, in the, the lung fields caused by a virus, not by a pneumonia. The pneumonia vaccine treats other things, not viruses. Right. Um, okay, so let's uh, let's just take a look at uh, some of the questions. Lots and lots of questions, uh, really some some fantastic ones. And thank you, I appreciate they've come to us uh, through all sorts of uh, through all sorts of uh, methods. But uh, uh, the, you know, so we try and, and put them all together. A few people asking about the uh, blood types. Has any further studies been done on that? We we read somewhere we spoke about type O that uh, that is less susceptible so there, there are studies out at the moment that type o is supposedly less susceptible because you've got anti-a antibodies because of it but if you've got type b blood type then you should also have anti-a antibodies so we don't know as of yet if there's a major hoo-ha about the bloods yet it was a very small trial not done a large amount of people they still need to do a lot of trials over and above all of this but we need to see of these people who are sick in icu how many of them are o negative or how many are o positive how many are B, how many are A, we don't know yet. And we can't hinge our bets on these blood types as being the answer for this. You know, it's so interesting, and it's just an observation I thought of whilst you were, whilst you were talking, is, and maybe we're all guilty of it, we, we like magical thinking. And we're all hoping that there's some little thing that we're going to find that, I don't know, vitamin, uh, whatever it would be, that if we just do that, well, then it cures it all because that's the secret sauce here. Everybody yeah. wants the unicorn and the rainbow. Everybody yeah, it's, it's wants so that. It's so interesting that it's so much part of human nature that we say, oh, you know, now we finally, Correct. finally discovered what the secret source is here in this. In uh, it's, 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 it obviously reflects a lot, says a lot about our own frame of mind, how desperate we are uh, that we resort to magical thinking. I'm not saying that that is magical thinking, but, uh, but it's just such an interesting thing. Do you see a lot of it? I think we, we've got to make a very important point here is that, with all these magical cures and all these magic things, the medical fraternity is not withholding medication. Everything that we are giving is medication that has been hopefully tried and tested, and we are trying to peer review the medication. Well, are you not? Are you not employed by Big Pharma? Unfortunately, not. If I was employed by Big Pharma, well, then we'd be in a different situation. <laughs> right. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, a, a, a very interesting question, and I think a very relevant question is, how many days should one go back? Assuming one finds that they, are, they, they get sick and they, they get a positive result, how far back should a person go in informing other people that they might have been in contact with? So generally within 48 hours of developing symptoms, that's when you should inform other people. If you're asymptomatic, then you won't know that you've had symptoms uh, not sure why you'd be testing unless you had contact with somebody mm, else, mm. but then either from the time of contact or from the time of the test. So, so the so generally 48 you, hours, uh, if you've got symptoms, before so symptoms. symptoms start sort of before 48 hours and in that right. period you're contagious. And then the incubation is from two to nine days, two to 10 after days. That. Okay. Uh, please can you ask Dr. Marburg, how long after recovering from COVID with mild symptoms can one resume gym or exercise? I think that's got to take, be taken on, on a personal basis. You've got to understand what your limitations were before you had the virus, what you could do before you had the virus, and therefore what you can do after you've had the virus. How are you feeling? Are your oxygen levels low? Have you got a heart rate that's increased dramatically? If all of these things are normal and you're feeling well and you're post the virus, at least a week post the virus and feeling well with no symptoms, then you should be able to resume back to your, to your normal routine. But if you've had the virus, and you didn't used to run 21 kilometers, don't start running 21 kilometers post-virus, but then you'll end up in trouble. Just take it very easy and listen to your body, I suppose. Correct. That's, I think that's... Uh, so uh, also somebody asking, they're saying that they lost a cousin who uh, was 64 years old, um, had no comorbidities, passed away uh, from, from COVID. So it seems to be that uh, it was a patient of yours, but that's, uh, I think, a bit irrelevant. And uh, the, the question is, are you seeing patterns? You know, we speak about comorbidities a lot. The, the people that are becoming seriously ill, the people that are succumbing to the, to the virus, are they always people with comorbidities? Well, clearly not. I think not. people need to understand what comorbidities are. Okay, mm. you've got to understand. If you've got high blood pressure, if you've got diabetes, if you've got some type of chronic lung disease, 
if you're a smoker, these are all things that put you at a higher risk, and those are the comorbidities. The sick people, if, you've got a, if you're obese, that's a major comorbidity. The sick people we're seeing, the ones who are landing up in ICU, are not the healthy people generally. It is the people with the comorbidities. The people who don't look after themselves a lot of the time, but even people who do look after themselves, if they get sick, they can land up in trouble. So comorbidities are a big thing here. And as I say, it's generally not the people that are healthy without the comorbidities that land up in ICU. Right. Um, unsigned here says, we're an elderly couple. One of us has cardiovascular disease. The other has hypertension. Our grandchild is a toddler. Is it still not possible for us to look after him once in a while? Definitely not. We also don't know how much virus is shed from the secretions from a young child. Have they got a high affinity for these ACE2 receptors? Can they secrete more virus? Even though they're not the super spreaders and they're not the big transmitters, is it more prevalent in the younger children? We don't know. But if you've got cardiovascular disease, stay away from young children, stay away from people. We are still in lockdown, despite what people think. We shouldn't be having parties. We shouldn't be having gatherings. We shouldn't be getting together as people. We should still be in the lockdown, boring, going to work, etc. Right, there's definitely a sense, and, and let's talk about it once we hear, that as, as I mentioned before, the weather's a little bit better, there's a bit of optimism in the air, because perhaps it's stabilizing. There's a real risk, I know, of a number of groups that got together yesterday. Uh, can, you, can, can you speak to that? Look, I don't know if anyone got together yesterday, but that's pure negligence as far as I'm concerned. You shouldn't be getting together. We shouldn't be cohabiting together. We shouldn't be in the same areas together. It's still dangerous. The virus, even though we're thinking we're reaching a plateau or an amount of sort of recoveries that are, are stabilizing, the virus is still there. It's still prevalent. It's still spreading. It's still contagious. We are not greater than the virus at this point. The virus is stronger than us. We have to respect the virus in order for the virus to respect us. All right. Should one avoid annual checkups at the moment, ones that might be overdue? Uh, example, uh, you're going to your dermatologist. Uh, uh, somebody's asked here about going to their gynecologist for their regular checkup. Uh, what's your thoughts on that? Look, we've said that you should continue with your chronic medication. You should check with your chronic conditions. You should be having your chronic checkups with your doctors. Unless your doctors are involved in the front line and are seeing COVID patients all day and they don't have the ability to see you, that's a different story. But otherwise, you should be going for your chronic checkups. No doubt about it. Right. A question about a quarantine in a family. If dad had direct contact with somebody with COVID, dad was wearing a mask and a shield, uh, would dad have to go into quarantine? Would the rest of the family have to go into quarantine? They've had no contact with a person who has COVID. Uh, should dad be going for a test? So the problem answer is depending on how long dad was in contact with the person. Was the other person wearing a mask? Was the other person wearing a shield? How far away from each other were they? Did they socially distance from each other? There's many confounding variables in this whole story. So if the person wasn't wearing a mask or wasn't wearing a shield and they didn't socially distance, dad needs to go straight into quarantine and, and stay away or actually isolate from the family. And therefore the family won't have to worry about quarantining themselves or isolating. That's the, the easy answer. Right. Any further, any further thoughts or development around the airborne nature or droplet spread um, of the disease? Look, there's lots of talk about the airborne spread of the disease. And I think there's still a lot of, of data that's going to come out describing what it actually means to say that it's airborne versus droplet. At the end of the day, and I've said this every week, it doesn't matter whether it's airborne or droplet, you've still got to maintain your social distancing. You've still got to wear your masks. You still got to wear your, your vases if you're a healthcare worker or in that type of environment. If people are sitting in a choir together, they shouldn't be in the same room together because then it's a high spread of the virus. And we don't know who the super spreaders are who are going to spread the virus together. Don't be in a communal gathering together. It's a high spread of virus. So airborne droplet spread, who knows at this point in time. But we do know you've got to take care of yourself. You've got to protect yourself and obey all the laws of the virus. Can one get COVID-19 from takeaway food? Does heating food kill the virus? Uh, if the chef didn't wear a mask or wash hands or uh, touched containers, can it be transmitted? So look, most of the restaurants we, we deal with are reputable restaurants. And everyone's got a health and safety guidance that they've got to go by. They've got to wear masks. They've got to wear vases. They've got to wear gloves. They've got to keep clean the whole time. It's unlikely to get the virus from food. There haven't been any major studies showing that the food does transmit the virus 
I wouldn't be too worried at this point. Right. And uh, how long does the virus stay on various surfaces? Well, it can be anything up to 72 hours. It depends on what type of surface, on metals, on, on cardboard. Just protect yourself, you know, wash your hands, do all the necessary things that we've spoken about before. And if you're really worried, you can leave a cardboard box for 24 hours before touching it. Uh, if I have hypertension, but it's under control with medication, does that make me high risk? No, you, you are not higher risk if you have hypertension. But, and this is a very important point, it is if you do get the virus, it doesn't mean because you've got hypertension, you're going to get the virus. But it does mean if you do get the virus, then there's a higher chance of you getting sicker. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to land up in ICU or you're going to land up in high care, but there's a higher chance of you because of the comorbidity getting sicker. And that's also a lot due to the expression of the receptors and a higher receptor count of the virus getting increased virus replication or other issues related to that. Right. Uh, when do you think schools should open? Look, I, I think that's quite a tough one. But I think before, before schools open, we've got to see a major trend going downwards dramatically. At this point in time, I think the numbers last night were still 11,000. So that's still high. It doesn't mean that we can put ourselves in a situation where we can go to shores because then again, we're putting ourselves in a situation, airborne, droplet spread, community together, everyone around each other, and we're going to make the virus spread much quicker. You know, if you're in, an, in a different environment where the virus is not spreading at all and there's a major decrease and there's hardly any active cases, then we can re-challenge the subject. Mm. And I would imagine it'll, it might the, the warmer weather might present different options as well if you could have services outside uh, spread out in, uh, in, in, in the open air. I'm, I'm not sure on that either yet. Let's, let's okay. wait and You're see what convinced. happens. I'm so not you're convinced. very skeptical at this point about the ability to safely open synagogues and other places of worship? De definitely in Gauteng. Definitely in Gauteng, right. they shouldn't be opening anything. Okay. And, and uh, schools? So, the same thoughts. I think, as I said, we're watching schools on a, on a two-weekly basis. Remember, it's, it's not just a scientific or a medical or technocratic question. It's an emotional and a moral question we're dealing with here. We're mm -hmm. not just dealing with children. We're dealing with, with teachers. We're dealing with staff. And we've got to put it all together as one type of, of unit and decide the benefits for the children from the emotional, from the anxiety point of view, as well as benefits for the teachers and the auxiliary staff and we've got to see that numbers are coming down and stabilizing before we decide that. Yeah, because in fact, somebody asking, how does the health of staff um, outweigh the mental health of our children sitting in front of computers for five hours a day can't be good for these kids. When do you see a change regarding the schools? Well, you've just answered that. We have yeah, to just... Yeah, and the health of staff is extremely important. Is extremely, extremely important. Yeah, yeah. Uh, another question somebody says might be a silly thing, but many of us are suffering with bovine brain, just forgetting how to do normal things, making crazy errors, uh, sitting at the wheel and forgetting how to drive, searching for things that are in front of our eyes. Is this, is this the stress of the virus keep creeping into? our brain membrane it's, it's actually such a, a relevant question and it does sound silly. it's a very good question i'll tell you why because if you have a stroke patient they lose what we yes. call muscle memory when they have a stroke and you've got to rebuild mm. that memory of the muscle the muscle atrophies you've got to rebuild it up so it actually starts building up the cells the movement the whole actual process of it so we're in a situation now where we're doing things which we haven't done before where we're not used to doing things and going back to the reality of our lives prior to covid is very different. We're not used to that. So this so-called bovine brain that you're calling it, it does make sense. Do you have another term we can call it? Because I think we need a nice term for it. <sighs> Pure, plain <laughs> forgetfulness. <laughs> yeah, just losing yeah. it completely. Yeah, yeah. Because we all are. And I think that's the other point. Is we, we, could, we could call it lockdown, day five billion, gazillion, trillion, zillion, yeah, billion. It, it, the reality yeah. is that everybody's feeling this. Nobody's feeling any different. And, and it's interesting because there were quite a few questions that had a certain aggressive, quite an aggressive tone around mm -hmm. it, um, quite angry. And it's almost like the stages of grief. You know, people go through grief and mm -hmm. there's the, the loss, the anxiety, the stress, the anger. This is what people are going through. This is the reality of what we're living through at the moment. You know, people are being withheld from doing their normal daily activities of life. It's understandable. And, and again, it's something that uh, we have mentioned before um, in conversations with a psychologist. He, he, he pointed out the significant loss that our children are feeling. Kids mm -hmm. that are in a year, it will, 
every year brings its own excitement and things to look forward to, whether it's a trip overseas, whether it's a matric dance, whether it's yeah. the, you know, for, for Jewish kids, a bar mitzvah or a bat mitzvah. There, there's 100%. a tremendous amount. It's very of, relevant. It's, it's very of, relevant. Of, and, of loss. And, and because of that, it's, it's very relevant. When is this, this vaccine coming? You know, I think that's Next very, question. very relevant. Absolutely. And, and I think yeah. we, we've got to discuss that in, in quite a bit of detail because the development of this COVID-19 vaccine is moving at a tremendously fast pace. They are not skipping any of the stages in, in, the, in the workout of this virus. And the time from the virus identification to the actual first trial injection in human was only 65 days, which is massive, okay? Mm. They look at the four phases of a trial. The first phase is about the safety and immunogenicity of the, of the actual of vaccine, where they take a small group of healthy people and they determine, is it safe? and does it produce antibodies? The second stage, they take the maximum possible dose to produce a maximum possible antibody to use on different populations, whether they're old, whether they're young, whether they've got comorbidities. The third phase, which most of the vaccines are now, is a vaccine that's given to thousands of people to test for efficacy and safety and compare it to the placebo. And the fourth phase of the virus will be when the virus is approved by the FDA or other bodies where it's licensed and approved and manufactured, and there will be many ongoing studies to see the relevance of the virus. Is it working? Is it still safe? So I think there's lots going on from virus study. I see Russia point, uh, put a, a message out yesterday that they're gonna have the vaccine ready by October. Um, I'm not sure if that's got to do with the American elections or other things like that, but um, let's see, let's hope. They're moving rapidly, and we, we're hoping for a vaccine sooner than later. And uh, what about the uh, immunity or antibody testing? So I still don't believe that it helps as much on a medical front to have the antibody testing. It will help you if you're donating things like convalescent plasma to know if you've got the antibodies, but we still, and I'm going to rehash the point, we still don't know what your immunity passport is. In other words, is it valid for three weeks? Is it valid for six weeks? Can you recatch the virus three months later? We don't know these things. So it's almost like a false positive result because you get mm. this good news that you've got antibodies, but we don't know what it actually means in this novel virus. Well, it's interesting because Laura um, asks this exact question. He's, she says, lately I've been hearing stories about people who have tested positive. They do everything that the doctor says. They're feeling wonderful after 14 days and suddenly two to three days later, they start feeling uh, terribly ill. Is it that they got it again or is this it's just the, the pattern of the virus. So this is the pattern of the virus. You know, with a lot of people with, who get, for instance, influenza and they get sick, it takes them about two weeks to get better. People mm. who are getting moderately ill or, or, or critically or severely ill can take them six to eight weeks before they actually resolve through all of their symptoms. And a lot of people are overdoing it after that 14 day period. They think, great, 14 days is over. I can go back in society and go back to my norm normalcy. But the problem is one of the biggest issues of this virus is post-virus fatigue, fatigue, tiredness, and overdoing it. So you've got to take it slow. And as you correctly said, you've got to listen to your body. Yeah. Um, uh, Carol says, uh, if one's temperature is taken daily uh, with an old mouth thermometer, can we assume that we're not positive with the virus if, that's, if our temperature is normal? That's just one of the screening tools. We've got to look for cough, shortness of breath, and nosmia, which is loss of smell, loss of taste, all those type of things add together, gastrointestinal symptoms, a whole host of clinical symptoms put together. We can't just hinge it on one thing. It's a screening tool to help us, but it's not a definitive only diagnosis. A few people have asked about uh, different uh, products to, to clean the house or clean, clean surfaces. Is there anything particularly that you recommend? I know that, that when I go into the studio every morning um, at, at, at Hyphen, we have one of these spray, um, you know, the, these things to spray your shoes and your, yourself just to, for, I mean, are these, are these all good ideas? They're all very good ideas. Um, keep your surfaces clean with antibacterial wipes or antibacterial sprays. Keep on washing and keep on washing your hands. For bigger institutions, are using hypochloric acid type solutions, which are safe to people, which don't cause any skin irritation or cause any trouble with that. Other institutions are fogging quite often where they use mm -hmm. a spray that fogs the whole office. So these things are important and necessary. The other alternative, you can't afford these things if you've got a big institution, is to clean the place properly and then leave it for 24 hours. That's also reasonable. 
Right. So, uh, so these things are still all very good ideas and just keep and relevant. Yeah. And, and, and relevant and keep, uh, keep doing that. Um, the, uh, the, the issue of herd immunity, is that still a thing that we're looking for? That's going to take a long time. We need 60 to 70% of the population to be immune from the virus. So that's not going to happen until we've got a vaccine. And, uh, and you have given us a, uh, you have, given us a, 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 a time, well, not really a timeline, but I mean, but it is moving. We are it progressing forward at a rapid rate, correct? Yes, yes. Um, okay, and again, a lot of people asking, oh, somebody's saying uh, a lot of people are looking for an au pair to help maybe spend time with the kids in their homes. Your thoughts? Definitely a no-no. You're bringing somebody into your home that's introducing new bacteria, new viruses, different protocols, you don't know what they're carrying. It's not. It's not. It's not warranted. It's not right. Don't do it. The you're on call this weekend, and uh, I think you were on call if I if I remember correctly, around about three weeks ago. That was a a, a horrific weekend. It was reported in, in in the papers. I think you had 42 serious COVID admissions. I'm not quoting you. I'm quoting the paper. I know that you're quite reticent about uh, repeating eating the numbers that you deal with. Uh, what's, your, what's been the experience this weekend compared to a few weeks ago? So I think people are going to understand that, albeit that the numbers have slowed down, we're still getting multiple admissions into hospital, sick people, a lot of people that don't come out of hospital because they are extremely ill. So albeit there's not as many admissions and it has slowed down, but this virus is still there and it's still causing havoc. But we are a bit more relaxed in inverted commas than we were three weeks ago when we were under complete, complete disheveled and, and totally taken over by the virus. Uh, I just, uh, I am going to go back to one question. I apologize. I thought uh, I had covered most of this, but uh, on Twitter, somebody asking, please, could you ask Dr. Myberg, um, are you a high risk of complications if you are on ACE inhibitors? No. for high blood pressure. No. Is that no, the same answer that I gave before, that you that you said before? No, so so this is for, for blood pressure medication that's caused an ACE inhibitor. And people think because of the ACE2 receptor that the virus attaches to, it makes you at a high risk. You do not, you are not at a high risk. You must not stop your ACE inhibitor. You must continue with the ACE inhibitor drug. Very important. Okay, so I just want to, uh, before we wrap it up, I want to summarize it as far as I understand the situation. And you'll tell me uh, if, if, if I'm horribly wrong or not. Is we, we have, there's a good chance we passed the peak. But, and, and things are stabilizing. Um, we, the hospitals are coping and, uh, and you are managing with it. However, it is absolutely critical that everybody remains vigilant as difficult and as unpleasant and as hard as it is, because we have to maintain this uh, in order to get through this. It, does that... Does that summarize so, your message I, I today? I think we, we've got to stop using these words peak and plateau because it also does give people false hope. I think we, we know that the numbers are stabilizing. That, that's an important thing to understand. The numbers are definitely stabilizing. There, there's definitely a, a better feeling amongst doctors. There's definitely a def, better feeling amongst nurses. The hospitals are coping extremely well at the moment. They are not being overflowed. And if they are overflowed, there's plenty of other hospitals that are able to take their patients and take on, on the actual burden of the disease. So I think that it is extremely important that people realize now more than ever, you've got to be more vigilant. You've got to look after yourselves more carefully because if we are going to use the word peak and plateau, we want this to remain. We want this to say, hold on, we don't want the numbers to go up dramatically. We don't want to have a major surge again. We want to prevent a surge from happening. This is the way to do it. So, uh, so Dr. Marburg, is there a good news? Is there is there good news? There is good news this week. I think the recoveries are continuing to go upwards, with overall recovery rate above sixty five percent, and active cases are starting to flatten. That's number one. Number two, in our old age home, the Jewish old age home, there were only eight new cases across all the Heber Kedusha facilities, with ninety three recoveries and thirty six active cases. Another thing, an Israeli company called Onik Caramel has developed a new face mask for medical staff with a filter that lasts up to 60 hours, which will allow healthcare workers to wear the mask continuously with no issues, which has been compared to the N95 mask. And the most important of the good news, 
I'm scared. The latest to Liverpool I'm, kit is oh, out, oh, and boy, go. is it hot. So go and get your Liverpool <laughs> kits now. Be safe. Look after yourself. Stay well. Keep vigilant. Wash your hands. Wear your masks. Social distance, social distance, and social distance. I'm Howard Feldman. This has been your Sunday Synthesis podcast with Dr. Anton Marburg. We'll see you next week, hopefully with continued good news.